Alan Hamilton is my name, and uh, carrying out a series of interviews uh, under the heading of the series of Piper's Persuasion. And this is number two in the series. Today we have the interview a very interesting man, uh, Jim Work. Jim uh, is a Piper, which is the main reason why he's been interviewed. He's a composer, a pipe major, a judge, he's on musical committees in the Pipe Band Association, and he's got uh, views and everything. Uh, and that's uh, what we're very interested in hearing. We'll introduce him now. Jim, hey, tell me when, where, circumstances you were born and, and leading up to your first introduction to the Great Highland Bagpipe. I was, um, because Glasgow was such a big city at the time, I was born outside of Glasgow. I was taken to Lennox Castle Hospital in Stirlingshire mm -hmm. uh, because there were so many people with the industrial age that we were living through and it was after the war. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of kids being born because life has changed so much for people. So, But I was actually brought up in a place called Plantation. People might be able to pinpoint it because there's a, down at the Clyde there's a science centre, that big building. Now that's where actually I went to work when I left school too. Uh, but I was born in 1949 and my father worked in the docks. And it's funny how life works out. The question that you've asked me, I've asked quite a lot of uh, highly regarded professional musicians. And if I can just digress for a minute to explain mm -hmm. to you. Years ago I was in London and a famous American drummer called Ed Shaughnessy that very few people haven't really heard of, top at his game. Uh, and I asked him, after the workshop I said, I hope you don't mind me asking, how did you start this? His father worked in the docks and he was called the Union Man. But the Union in those places was different from what our unions were. They were more welfare orientated. And folk would go there and uh, borrow money to pay their rent and stuff like that. And Ed's father, obviously, because for the sake of the, the fund, would ask them for some sort of collateral to place against the money that they'd loaned them so that if they didn't pay it back, they could sell something and get the money back. And this guy brought in an old drum and he said, that's fine, they put it away in the corner. And the guy never came back to repay his debt, so the drum stayed there. And when Ed was born and grew up, he found this drum sitting in the corner and just started rattling away at it and became one of the greatest kit players in America, purely by accident. Amazing. So where I was brought up in Glasgow, um, because of the industrialization of the place, uh, there was a lot of air pollution. Uh, Glasgow was probably one of the first cities to actually pass legislation to cut down the amount of smoke that was generated by people's household fires. Uh, I remember the days when the coal men used to come round the street, chant their wares, and people would they would carry sacks of coal, a hundred weight of coal on their shoulders up these stairs. We were staying in a tenement flat, and uh, it was very common in those days for kids to develop diseases related to the poor conditions that we lived in. So I actually grew up with um, chest infection, uh, bronchitis. It wasn't asthmatic, but it was bronchitis, which was fairly common in those days. Uh, I didn't realise that my parents had spoken to the doctor about what was the future for Jim, what was going to happen to him. So I did the usual stuff. I, I joined the Life Boys, which was the reversion of the Boys Brigade. I think I lied about my age to get in. I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, anyway, when I got to the Boys Brigade, like the first night we were there, a guy called one of the officers, a guy called Alec McLean, who was the in charge of the pipe band, which was in Kinnan Park, just across across the street from Plantation, where I was brought up. It's funny how these boundaries work. Like Paisley Road West. Right. One side it's plantation, the other side it's Cannon Park and whatever. So we went to, into uh, the BB and the, gr the group of us who went, went there were offered the chance to play in the pipe band. So I went home that night and said, uh, uh, the man said that they weren't looking for people for the pipe band. And what I didn't know was at the time that the doctor had said to them, 
that I've had learned to play a wind instrument that might actually help my health to improve my chest expansion and stuff like that. So they said, I was absolutely taken aback because my father and I didn't have long philosophical discussions about the meaning of life. Right. You usually get a clip round the ear if your meaning of life was different for his. <laughs> uh, and they said, yeah, right. fine. And I actually started in the Boys Brigade, which is probably where lots of people, certainly from Glasgow and probably Edinburgh and these places, mm -hmm. actually started learning to play the pipes. And it was the, I think the generosity of people like Alec McLean who were prepared to gear up their time going to the boys' brigade on a Friday night, going to a band practice on a Wednesday night, whatever it was, uh, that helped people to get on. And the really ironic thing was that uh, having started in this, and Alec McLean was teaching us, uh, my father told one of his pals, who was a docker, he'd known for years, a guy called Angus Campbell who came from Carradale, and... Uh, he taught me for years. He gave me the finest one-to-one -one mm -hmm. training. I would, if he was still alive, mm -hmm. I would tell anybody to take, whether it's really whether it was the violin or the guitar or whatever, to go to this piper and talk to him about their kid's progression because he was just a fabulous musician. At the time, I didn't appreciate it. I was just being taught hard stuff all the time because that's what he did, you know. Once you'd learn to play... Like when the battle's over, that was it gone. It was all heavy duty stuff that you got after that. And uh, he was just a fabulous musician. He, in fact, at that time, you'll remember this, at that time, there was always a debate that uh, if you were quite a good piper, maybe you wouldn't go into a pipe band because... I... Do you remember those days? What's your view on that? Oh, I, listen, I think this has changed dramatically. Uh, he told me, he played with Eddie McClellan, and mm -hmm. the Dot Labour Board had a pipe band once upon a time. And he also played in the uh, Clan McRae, and he also played in the uh, Shepherds pipe band as well, I think. It's a long time ago now for me, because I'm old. <laughs> but I think nowadays, the pipers and drummers that we have are probably, experience-wise, and their approach to the game is far superior to the one that we had. We were focused on perfecting stuff. And when you went to a pipe band, maybe it wasn't the way that you played the tune that the pipe band played it and you just put up with it. But these guys have become like session musicians now. Yes. They live remotely. By that I mean hundreds of miles away from where the band is. They get sent drum scores or pipe scores through the mail. Uh, there won't be any tapes or CDs for, for them to be helped along with this. They'll just get the music, learn it, and they'll go to a band practice. Of course, we know that bits of it will not be spot on, but these are people who are travelling hundreds of miles and just slotting into a musical ensemble and their instruments are in tune and they can do the job. And I think that there are probably now far more competent musicians per head of capita in pipe band world now than there was when you and I were doing this. I thing. definitely agree, yes. yes. And I, I, I think that to a certain extent, I'm a wee bit jealous of them. I mean, I've had a great time doing this. I would never have had the opportunity to write the music that I'd written, Alan. I would never have had the opportunity to study playing the way I studied, believe it or not, watched you playing and all the guys who were a wee bit older than me because this is all my interest in developing yeah, this thing. Yes. But I'm a wee bit jealous of them because they get to do things that you and I never got to do. Absolutely. Did you do any solo piping uh, you know, between that age, the early teens, and joining a band or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I had, How um, did you go on with that? Well, once again, this Angus Campbell guy was just so good at what he did. Uh -huh. I went from being a Glasgow boy right. who was brought up in the docks, uh, who learned to play the pipes by accident, mm -hmm to within like four or five years winning solo piping competitions. Was that in Glasgow? Yeah, College of Piping, stuff like that. Yeah, great. And the, the, the really the interesting thing for me in all of this was that I didn't know a lot of pipers because I was just a kid. I knew the guys in the band. The band that I joined, that Angus told me to join, was a local band, the Kenan Park Pipe Band. That was Willie Kinnear? That's right. 
That's right. Willie Kinnear was the, the pipe major, and he, he had that band for a long, long oh, number aye. of years. Aye. aye. He was the band. Aye, he was. And his wife, Bet. Yeah. They, they were the band. Aye. And it's a funny thing that uh, I've learned over the years, because of all the training and stuff like that that I've done and the people that I've met, I find that amongst musicians there are always more questions than there are answers sometimes. And uh, what I didn't realise was that <coughs> Wally Kinnear made the Kind of Park Pipe Band, but that was a vehicle for Wally Kinnear to do his thing. Yes. And what I didn't realise was that if you wanted to be an orchestral conductor and conduct great symphonies, uh, you were likely to have to form your own orchestra because nobody in the Berlin Philharmonic was going to step aside and say, right, Alan, it's all yours. Aye. If you wanted to have... If you were interested in folk music and how we wanted to do something like that, you actually had to get friends round about you who were singers if you weren't a singer, or, or drummers if you weren't a drummer. Seek out the other musicians that's right, that's and right. persuade and them to join your group. Put it group. together, put it together. Yes. And I began to realise now, and I think one of the one of the great examples of how that worked was Bob Shepard with Dyson and Dan Donald when he took these school kids and trained them up to be world champions. Yes. Uh, and that's that for me was the confirmation of what I eventually learned about how you develop as a musical leader, a band leader. Glenn Miller had yes. to have his own band. Yes. Nobody was going to give him a band for him to do his own stuff. Underpinning all your musical experience in your life as a, a broader musical education, uh, which is a wee bit different from your average piper or drummer who, in my day especially, uh, concentrated on a, just the one instrument, i.e. pipes or the drums. But you may not play other instruments, but you have, uh, it seems to me, a much broader knowledge of music per se. Where did that come from? Once again, that was interesting for me. I've just been so lucky in my life, so lucky that uh, all things have... I couldn't have planned it. Uh, he taught me, he taught me about... Angus taught me about uh, pipe music. And we went on from Peabrook, from the light stuff into Peabrook. And when I was a teenager, I won the, the three Peabrook prizes, one after the other. Uh, the McDougall Gillis, the Farquhar McRae and the Inver Inverchapel Trophy at Cowell. And that was, for me, a real achievement. But what I didn't really understand was that, and what people at that age don't realise is when you're learning about Peabrook, you're actually learning about an art form that's really quite imprecise and you have to learn pretty much what your teacher teaches you until you're old enough to interpret it yourself. And even when you do, you have to be careful about your interpretation if you're going to compete with it. And it turned out of course I didn't know this. It turned out that uh, my mother was a great singer. She almost became a member of ENSA, I think it was, during the war to entertain the troops. She was mm -hmm. that good a singer. But you wouldn't have known it because she didn't go out around the house washing the dishes and singing the latest hit song at a Rogers and Hart movie. <laughs> uh, but she, she was a great singer. Then it turned out that um, her father was a bit of a musician but her brothers were also musicians. Her brother, Alec, was a trumpet player and he did big band arrangements, sat at a keyboard and worked out orchestrations. My goodness. And his, the other brother, Dougie, was a French horn player. So I had all these influences and going on in my mind. Angus Campbell giving me heavy duty classical music okay. written by the McCalls, the McLeods, nothing was easy, nothing was easy. Mm -hmm. And then I had this other stuff like, my mother was a singer and she could, we had a uh, long relationship with Ireland because we had family there and she would sing Irish songs mm -hmm. and we would listen to Irish, proper Irish singing from the point of view that it wasn't any of this, any of this folk stuff that you would get after the chieftains, it was real proper Irish tenors who were singing. And they actually sounded like English people when they were singing Irish songs. Yes. Uh, because that was the kind of recordings that there were then. Thank the Lord that we're now able to have the chieftains and these people to listen to on recordings because it just wouldn't happen then. They would just have been a, a band shoved I, aside. you got a much broader 
perspective on the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and the thing about uh, this was that the influences that I got from these people about music was about uh, don't listen to music you like, listen to music you don't like and learn about it. And that's actually, see, for a young person, that's actually quite tough. That's difficult. Yes. That's quite, in fact, one of the first album, first albums, for goodness sake, one of the first vinyl recordings I bought mm -hmm. was uh, Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto. What kind of mug am I? I couldn't get into the shop and say to the guy, I'm quite interested in music, could you give me something that I might understand? I bought this thing, Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto, the Emperor Concerto. Mm -hmm. uh, and after I listened to it a couple of times, uh, I started reading the, the cover notes constantly because I didn't think one pianist could play all that. I was looking for the name of the other guy who was giving him a hand. It was so complicated. Amazing guy, yes. So complicated yes. because it just... How can you possibly learn about anything? It probably, I don't know. Uh, to me, when I looked back on it, it was like somebody said to me one day, Jim, you should study philosophy. And what I did was went to the shop and bought a piece by Plato that was written in Greek. Okay. To try and understand it. What a joke. <laughs> what a joke. It was more or less self-taught and self-investigated over a period of time. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I used to get into a bit of bother for that because I would listen to music that, uh, in fact, I still get into trouble for it that can be a wee bit um, challenging, shall we say. Okay. And uh, uh, once or twice I was told that I would probably end up in some sort of mental institution because of the kind <laughs> of music I was listening to. But it must, uh, say, all this experience and listening and reading must have helped you uh, in your piping, uh, just ever so quietly in the background. Oh, for sure. And especially with the... Uh, composing. When did you start composing? I have this, I, ha I have a memory. I do um, remember certain things. Like, I often wondered uh, where I got my interest in music from. And I was staying and I was invited over to Sweden to help a pipe band out. And the folk who invited me over gave me their flat to stay in for the weekend. Now, Swedish, the, the TV system that was running in the house, I don't know if it was typical of Swedish, Swedish TV, but like at 10 o'clock the programme shut down and you get the sound card up and they played music. And it was a funny thing happened to me when I was sitting watching it. I remembered as a kid uh, putting the TV on when the sound card was up and just listening to the music. Then I thought, that's when it started. I, I could hear this stuff on the TV which was just music. And that's when my interest started. Okay. And what I learned from all that, that long journey through, complicated, and yet also some... You ever heard of a guy called Spike Jones? He used to run a band in America where they did all sorts of percussive things and they had phone calls during the performance and it was just a hoot. Right. Uh, that was crazy stuff, absolutely crazy. And I loved that as well because all these people who were acting like clowns were all top-class musicians who were able to act like clowns. Very comfortable. Yes, yes. no bother. Right. And what I, what I learned from all that musical experience was that uh, I became not afraid to experiment with music. I became not afraid to have my own opinions. Uh, if you'd, and you could have said to me at some stage, because you were part of my growing up experience, you could have said to me one day, as a younger than you, young person, teenager, Jim, that's, I don't like that very much. That wouldn't have bothered me. Because I knew that people always didn't like new stuff all the time. That's, that's true, that's very true. And you've got to be comfortable with yourself. You have to. Yes. And um, years later, years later, I'd, uh, I went for a, a pint with Angus Campbell. Okay. Because by that time he had stopped teaching me. He was getting older, but I'd moved on. I was now in the police pipe band and I was quite self-sufficient because of what he taught me. I was quite self-sufficient. Anything that I wanted to do then. And he, he did this. Go and learn from other people. You've, you know how to do it all, but you have to learn from other people. And one day I was uh, I had a, a drink with Angus and I said, I've, I've written one or two pieces of music, Mr Campbell. There wasn't any Angus's or anything like that, it was okay. Mr Campbell. And he, do you know what he said to me? I, I was shocked, he said, oh, but you could always do that. 
I said, look, when did it start then? And I remembered um, playing tunes when I was practising. I mean, folk who haven't done what we haven't, have done don't understand this, how you would actually practise a single movement thousands of times a week uh-huh. just to perfect it. Yes. And you would play the same tunes over and over and over again. And then I remember uh, one night I was, I can't remember if it was Aberkey and the Highlanders or the, the Balmoral Highlanders or something I was practising, I actually started to extemporise and invent bits for it. And I must have done that. Uh, I did that because I was fed up playing the tune, can I make this any different? But he must have also seen me doing that and I didn't realise that. And he, he was smart enough to know that probably this guy was going to end up writing music and that's when it started. Right. And when he said to me, I bet you could always do that, I was like, well, why did nobody tell me? Is there any particular piece of music that you've written that you're particularly pleased about, uh, a, it's famous or whatever? Is uh, it? That's an interesting question, really an interesting question. I know, question. it's a difficult question, really, because... Aye, it's uh, like asking you what... Uh, your favourite day in your life was, you know, I because know, they've yes. all got pluses and actually your worst day could be the best day because you survived it. Like Tunes come and go. That's right. Yeah. I think um, I learned actually through the guys that I worked with in the band who weren't slow at telling you that what you'd written wasn't that good. Uh-huh. Okay? Yeah. Now, if, if you listen to these people the same way that composers all down through the years and let me say the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, for example, were probably told by their peers that, oh, you played that stuff, well, that's nonsense. They would have given up. This goes back to the question you asked earlier on about how did it affect my learning about the pipes from other pieces of music. It's sticking it out. Mm-hmm. It's getting on with it. Yes. And I learned, uh, actually, that you didn't like that tune, but somebody else did. And I suddenly realised that, actually, all I do is write the music. It's up to other people to decide whether it's, it's their good. their perception. Aye, yes. I've done a wee bit of painting in my life. Yeah, I know. And I've taken six paintings that I've done into a room with six different people yeah. and asked them to pick a painting and everybody picked a different painting. Yeah, it's excellent, and, isn't it? And you look at the painting that somebody's say, and they say, that's fantastic. And I'm saying to myself, it's not very good, that. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. That's right. I've done it, but it's okay. Yeah. But they see something that I don't see yeah. And it must be the same with your music. Yeah. That pe- that something strikes a chord. I Definitely. Like, and and it rings a bell for them, and, yeah. and their experience within them, and gives them a, a nice warm feeling. There's something that it hits home. Yeah. And it's possibly not done that for you. Yeah. You've you've made the tune. You say it's okay. Mm-hmm. Put it out there. Mm-hmm. But somebody else is really taking on with this tune, yeah. and yet a, a, a second person maybe not. Well, one of the, the things that really surprised me was uh, in the environment of being in a, a good ensemble, whether it's a theatrical ensemble or a musical ensemble, or having a, a circle that you might have had when you were painting, a circle of uh, painting friends, mm-hmm. hobbyists, yes. who would all take uh, the car down to the beach one day and paint Aaron or something like that. Uh, that environment can actually be quite stimulating, but also can be quite challenging as well. If you if you have that nature about you that I want to do something about this, I want to fix that, then it can propel you towards facing these challenges in the best way that you can. And you don't always succeed. And that's an important lesson for everybody is you win some and you lose some. Yes. And I could, when I, the tune Molly Connell, the wee Struths Bay, which has become enormously popular, I had no idea that would ever be like that. All I did was I sat down one night and I did this on one evening. I wrote three Struths Bays for the pipe band. Okay. Just off the top of my head, because I can do that. Uh, well, that's a lovely, interesting thing that I've never actually asked anybody to help me with is the creative process, how does it actually happen? Because it can be like that, or sometimes you sit down and really work at it, and sometimes the bits you've worked hardest at are the least satisfying for you, sometimes the spontaneous bits are just the best bits. Uh, I've actually lost one or two great tunes sitting at traffic lights, because I always wanted to see how the third part was going to be. 
and by the time I got to the third part, I'd forgotten how it had started. I started, I don't know. So I, I, I have no idea uh, how these things work, but for Molly Connell to be so successful, and it's actually very pleasing for me, for people to play my music, because it's like taking one of your paintings home and, and hanging it up. There's a satisfaction there that, yes. that maybe you've filled a, kind of a gap for somebody who was looking for something. Uh, and I never ever had any strong feelings about the music other than I just did the job, I wrote down what I thought was right. I've been surprised at some of the tunes that people have asked me if they can play because I didn't think they were particularly good. But that was because, I said yes of course, but that was because as you said their perception of the Perception. tune was different. Precisely. I think perhaps uh, you've mentioned it and the uh, Let's get right into it. When did you join the police? A long time ago. Aye, aye. <laughs> 1971, I think it was. 71. Yeah. And uh, so where, did, where were you posted? Dead lucky again. I'm a Glasgow boy and I get sent to the Central Police Office down in Turnbull Street. Okay. Right beside Glasgow Green. Right. And were, you were <coughs> A divisions that were subsequently known, and it's back to the central. Uh, things go around in circles all the time, don't they? Yeah. It was known as the central at that time, also. Uh, and really, all your service was at the, the, the one division. Or, yeah, that's yeah. right. I did, I did some uh, work in other places. Obviously, you'd be sent for uh, support. But you were a central races. guy. It was a central guy, yeah. Did you. Join the band right away during your probationary period, or did you wait until after a probationary period? No, I had, um, I did my probation, half of it before I decided to become involved with the band. Okay. Uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, the attraction of the band was absolutely fabulous because of the people that were in it. Alan, not least yourself, but Ronnie Laurie and McClellan. Yeah. The Pipers for me, mm -hmm. the attraction was just fantastic. But I wanted yes. to know, first of all, if I really wanted to be a policeman for a long time. Aye, aye. And when you join the police, uh, probably lots of folk would maybe disagree with this, but I think when you join the police, you're exposed firsthand to a lifestyle that sometimes you never knew existed. So you were shocking. Aye. Ah, it does. And it's interesting though. I, I, I mean, the, the, I, the, the, oh, I know. The I know, case, I know, the case, I know what you're speaking the about. The case yeah. that you raised earlier on, yeah. when we were talking about the, the guy who was dangled out the window until he actually said, right, you can have everything I've got, which was actually only a couple of quid and a watch or something Correct. like that from Aye. memory. Aye. Um, but the law itself is a very interesting subject. Of course it is. Criminal law in particular is fascinating because there are so many uh, nuances to the way it operates. And a funny thing I discovered over the years was that so many top class musicians were actually involved in the law as lawyers or as uh, legal advisors. Or Tchaikovsky was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And that there seems to be something about the interpretation of music and the interpretation of law that I find are actually quite close to each other and it depends on how you view something in particular whether it's this or that okay and I found that uh, whilst but you probably remember the days of, of the old city of Glasgow police where they handed a manual that thick yes of course with all the do's and don'ts Scottish criminal law and then you get Scottish criminal law and the road traffic thing and, uh, like two uh, bibles yes now I never believed. If somebody said to me one day, you'll read these for cover to cover, I would have said, go and bail your head in the, the Glasgow way. Uh, but I did actually. And I just found it so fascinating. I have to say, I wasn't um, uh, excited about reading about road traffic law. I, I've yet to meet somebody who is. A, I always thought you needed a frontal lobe lobotomy before. <laughs> You became interested in road traffic or to get a member of the traffic department, but that was just me as a detective. Aye. I was rather jaundiced. Aye. Aye. Well, I was I was the same uh, because once again, I I suppose I've used this word a lot. I've been lucky. 
Once again, in my police work, I got so many opportunities. I worked in the CID, I worked in plain clothes. I did all these things and got to meet new people and get new experiences. And I, I found that uh, the criminal law side of it was just enough for me to uh, be captivated by the ins and outs of how it all worked. So, Ian McClellan, was he the pipe major of the band when you joined yeah, us? Yeah. Ronnie Laurie had just left the, the pipe majorship of the band, I think it's 71, That's if right. memory strikes That's right. correct. And uh, Ian McClellan, to be frank, didn't have much of a band at that point. That's he had, right. He had to really he build it from the bootstraps up. So you'd been at the, the ground level there yeah. uh, just at that particular point. And could you maybe just describe to me what was going on there? That was still Glasgow Police Pipe Band until right. the regionalisation in 75. Right. So tell us about this, the early years. Well, the early years, um, I actually had quite a lot of sympathy for Ian and Ronnie, obviously, because although I was just a young man and had never done the job, I'd certainly been in a pipe band at the Kinnan Park with Willie Kinnear, which had won world championships and all that kind of thing. And so I knew about the standards you had to set, and I knew about the challenges that were there. But in the, the police band, it was actually even more complicated because um, of the different types of jobs that everybody did. You could never really be sure that you were going to get everybody together for a practice. Uh, not everybody was... Uh, classically trained to the extent where I've become a classically trained musician, I shall now join the police. What you had was what you got. And people joined the police who were pipers, people who joined the police who were drummers. And they gravitated towards the band if they wanted to. And some came and some went. And uh, the changes were constant. So it wasn't like, um, if I use the word, a civvy pipe band, where people... But, but actually pretty much like a club. I mean, one of the things about the Cannon Park Pipe Band was that I made friends in there who have been like lifelong friends. Yes. One of them, uh, Sandy Bell, who became the Pipe Major of Shots. He's, when Shots were stuck, Sandy stepped in and held them together for a couple of years until I think uh, Bob probably came along, Robert Matheson probably came along. And, okay. Uh, but that kind of thing, these are people that I knew for a long mm -hmm. time, but the changes always were... Uh, personnel changes for operational reasons and uh, you would never be sure about how it was going to work and the consequence was, as I said earlier on, uh, the players nowadays are as good as you'll get, they're professional, they're plug and play guys, so you give them anything to do, they'll learn to do it and they'll go and do it. In those days the regime was different, the study regime was different, the work regime was different, what you had to do was different from what it is now. and. Uh, my impression at the time was that it, it looked as if it had a future because at that time I was in the band, John Wilson was in the band and Alistair Ross was in the band and we were contemporaries. Yes. And I knew that, you you knew us as yes, kids. Yes, that's right. Uh, if I can say it, three really good players. Yes, We knew what they were Fantastic. doing. Fantastic. Yep. And I thought that uh, probably if it kept going like that, there would be a great band in the future only if the drum corps could develop along with it. Of course. Uh, and Alec Connell, who was leading drummer at the time, all the time I was there, uh, did a great job. Because he was faced with the same situation that Ian was. You had police officers who were pipers or drummers who came at the band, and you couldn't say no because you weren't good enough. Connell and McClellan were ex-BB boys as well. That's right. And uh, Alistair Ross played in the BB. He was right. with the 214 BB, which was a so great it's all the 214, and I think uh, Alec McIver. That's uh, right. And guys like that were very, very strict about their musical tuition yep. of McLaren, uh, Connell, and all that, that crowd, McMurchie, and everything else, to the extent that uh, they done a very, very firm and excellent grounding. Uh, to uh, progress in piping yeah, and drumming. Yeah. Well, Jimmy McGeeky, who was the bass drummer for all that time, had actually been a professional musician before he joined the police. A timpani drummer? Yeah. He played in, in symphony orchestras yes. and stuff like that. So th the nuts and bolts, what I could see, were there. 
and it would just be how long would it take and would it be good enough eventually and as it happened pretty much that group of people that you're talking about were the group of people who carried it through its great years Aye. for a long time yes for a long time you if it hadn't been for uh, the 78th Highlanders winning the World Championship. 78. Aye. Uh, we would have won maybe 10 World Championships in a row. It's amazing. And amazing. they were the guys who stopped it. When did the, the band really get its act together and start to win prizes? Uh, that early band that you, you've joined, uh, 71, was it yeah. 75 or 76 before? 76, really was probably when it started. In football in terms, uh, that's a long term a time, you know, a football manager now only gets half yeah. a season yeah, yeah. Uh, to prove yeah. that he's, he, he's up to it and yeah. win prizes. And folk uh, perhaps viewing this conversation would be slightly astonished that it took such a long time before even Ian McClellan managed to get yeah. this group up and running to the extent that they were recognised mm. by the judges. But that's maybe another conversation yeah. that we could touch on because it takes a long while to get your your name and the uh -huh. enterprise list, although you've maybe been playing well enough for a while before that. But again, how? why was it, it took so long and, and looking back now? Yeah. Actually, because of because of the high regard I had for that um, pipe band in its early days, we with Ian in it, and of course you had probably left just before I aye, came to the band. Aye, seventy one. I aye, was just and, moving out and aye, moved in. Aye. And Ronnie Laurie had been the pipe major of the band, and Ronnie had been quite innovative in a lot of the music that the band had played. But I think actually, I kind of used that as my. Uh, measurement of the prospects of people. If it took Ian McClellan with all his talent and ability, with the team that he had round about him five or six years to become recognised, I would say now, on reflection, unless you were dead lucky, um, anybody who took over as a manager of anything should be given like five or six years to see if it works. Yes. And the big problem of course is now that um, Everybody, down through the ages, folk will argue that the standards were higher. Yes, of course they were, but the standards now are different from what they were then. Yes. The type of music that's being played, both melodically and percussively, is different from what it was then. The organisations who carry these performances out are bigger and more demanding, the more pressures on them than never there was before. So you might argue that the standards are higher today, but individually, the talent of these folk hasn't changed very much. The best people who were in the police band are the same as the best people who are in the field marshal, SFU or whatever, but they're younger and they've got a more, um, much more quickly learned the things that we took time yeah, to learn. To, to express that even more fully, uh, you, Wilson and the rest of you, including Ian McClellan and, and Agnes McClellan and all the rest of were winning uh, solo prizes at that particular time, yeah. even in the early days when not winning as a, a group, as a band, but going out there competing at various games, yeah. at uh, various uh, painting, uh, indoor painting competitions. No doubt you would be uh, to the fore at that, uh, at that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think... Were I think you winning anything in the notable... Uh, well... Uh, or was that later on again? Later on, but... It's a, it's a strange thing. I think that as far as piping is concerned, piping's a bit like some sports. If there's no competition, the standards don't keep up. Okay. And I think competition helps to maintain standards. And I think any competition you play in is good for you because it sets a standard for you to try and match. Uh, every, every competition, from memory, every competition I played in professionally, I get some sort of prize. Might not have been the first prize. In fact, we went to London, uh, John and Harry and I, to play at the Brattach. Right. And uh, Harry, of course, is dead now, unfortunately. What a character he Harry was. Harry McAleer. Yeah. Uh, but Walter Cowan and I shared third prize in the March, Strathspain Reel, at okay. the Brattach. Okay. Now, that's quite an accolade. 
to get a third at that competition and we shared it and we get two pounds, fifty pence each. <laughs> Walter, Walter said to the court. And that's, that's the thing that people perhaps don't realise is that there is no animosity between us as competing papers. Aye. Walter come up to me and says, they have knocked it off tonight, Jim, haven't we? A whole two pound fifty to spend. For goodness sake. And that would probably have cost us in those days maybe about a hundred pounds just to make the trip to go and compete in that Aye. competition. And I think prob if we hadn't won anything, uh, you wouldn't have counted the cost. But no. it was the fact that you actually get third prize in such a notable contest and get two pounds fifty for it was just That's amazing, isn't it? Aye. Aye. Amazing. So you're competing, you're improving as individuals, uh, early seventies, uh, and you're going through. How is it that McClellan, uh, in your view, was able to improve in stages to bring the band up? Did they have any sort of uh, uh, method? Uh, they must have had, uh, and uh, uh, and we tricks up your sleeve. Uh, uh, the best use of uh, the material, i.e., the pipers and drummers. How, how did they uh, uh, get this into a group? Uh, it's a very um, interesting question with an amusing outcome, as I will tell you later. Um, Ian was a super talent as a player, you know that. Ian and Ronnie spent a lot of time together. You know this because you were more yes. contemporaneous with them as solos than I was. Uh, they swapped instruments, they ex knew sounds, they experimented with sound and that kind of thing. And Ronnie was, as I said, a great innovator, so Ian had a chance to um, sample that on his journey. Uh, but what Ian had was this ability to just go about doing the job quietly. There was never any demonstrations of uh, temper, there was never any flamboyance. It just, it would, for Ian it was quite simple. You were either in tune or out of tune, mm. or on time or not on time. It was fairly simple. Aye. And uh, the funny thing is, uh, I learned a lot for I learned a lot from everybody, Alan. I, I watched everybody to yeah. see what they did, how they played things, and I don't just mean pipers, I mean pop groups and orchestras and stuff like that. And the thing about Ian was Ian never Ian never actually taught you anything. You had to ask him, why did you do this? He would never say to you, I did this for that reason. Like one day, uh, it, we, we used to do very intensive tuning, as you know, but Ian, Ian was an absolute master at that, very <coughs> intensive tuning. And you learned, the hardest thing in the world is for two pipers to play in tune. But you learned how to do it with him because he would check your instrument one to one. And uh, one day he checked his instrument. It was a world championship, for goodness sake. He checked his instrument with a, one of the guys in the band and they weren't in tune. But when Ian said, right, that's fine, off you go. Uh, so I made a point of saying to him, Ian, you just tried your chanter with him and it wasn't a spot on. He said, yeah. There was no follow-up, like, because I said, so why did you why did you say it was all right when it wasn't? He says, I know when he gets out there, <clears throat> the pressure comes on, you blow a wee bit harder. Aye, nerves, uh, nerves. And <coughs> what, he, what he said to me, one of the things that he said to me, just in conversation, not because I'd become the pipe major or anything like that, <clears throat> because I'd spent a lot of time teaching other bands. I'd, I'm really pleased at a lot of the things that I've done. If that's yeah, without that, being arrogant about well, that. That's what we're here to discuss. Yes. Aye, and. Uh, Ian said to me one day when we were talking about this, he said, the most important thing for any leader is to know the people well. Of course. Know their strengths and weaknesses. Be able to read them. That's yes. right. Uh -huh. And he could do that. Mm -hmm. But and for a long time, <laughs> for a long time while we were winning world championships, I would like go and do workshops in various parts of the, the world where people wanted to learn about pipe bands. Where do you get that sound from, Jim? How do you manage this? And I would explain to them about how Ian had this particular sound in his mind. Because every piper's different. We don't work from a standard pitch. We work from a kind of somewhere in there thing. And uh, all the time, he was constantly searching for this. In fact, I've, I've been in competitions where, <coughs> for example, he would try your pipes, his pipes oh, with me, okay. and then he would try them with you. And then he'd say, uh, Jim, come here a minute. I want you to sink your read a wee bit. And I'll say, what for? 
well, I've just tied my pipes with Alan, and I liked the sound of his pipes better than mine's. That's what he was like. Yes. So he would change the whole sound. I experienced he, that with him. Aye, because he heard something that he liked. Aye. And that was what was amazing about him, because any other pipe major would have said, you're too sharp, flatten it a wee bit or whatever, but if he heard it and he thought it was better, he went for it. So he wasn't uh, egotistical about his own uh, ability, his own instrument. It was, uh, it was quite sort of calm and... Uh, and he was, he was so good that he, he was quite happy uh, to yeah. say, well, your pipes are better than mine today, so we'll tune the band off That's your right. pipes. That's right. There was no arrogance about And just the before I left the band, I had that experience with him. Uh, uh, he'd come up and say, oh, pipes are going all right today, Scotty. That's so, right. And that was uh, about as good as it would get. Aye. There was no full uh, praise no, or anything no, like no. that. No, that was it. Yeah. That was the accolade. And he uh, just stood there. And you get somebody else to come up, and then the next thing you were getting, uh, the band was tuning off your answer. Yeah, yeah. But you still listened to your answer, and, and if it degraded, mm -hmm. then. Aye, but the, you could you do know, that. He, the, the guy was so. Aye. Uh, it's a funny thing, the difference between arrogance and self confidence. Probably he was so self confident that he was able to change his mind. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Rather than being someone who lacked confidence and was afraid to hedge. Mm -hmm. uh, to change their mind for hedging their bets could be a problem. I didn't bother him. And that's probably, probably why the band was so successful because he could adapt to any situation and not get fussed about it yeah. at the last minute. No, he didn't. He a didn't. change of weather, uh, five minutes to he go. Didn't. He timed everything. Uh, I watched him. He timed uh, everything he did to see yeah. the kind of day. It's a bit dull and windy, quite cold. We'll start the band a wee bit earlier or uh, whatever. I'd, in fact, I get a lot of people don't have the confidence to no. say we'll get them out 11 minutes before That's we're right. due to go on. And he did that. He did that. I remember, in fact, I got an email from Bill Livingston recently. I was talking to him about some of the tunes that he'd written. And Bill, of course, was the pipe major of the band, the first overseas band to win the World Championship here. Uh, and he was taught, he mentioned one time at Cowell where he saw us just setting up and it was like no time at all. It was done. And... However he managed to arrange this, I don't know. And this is the point, the funny bit of the story I'm going to come to. Uh, but wherever we went, when we got into the groove, like probably after the time you left, the whole band could be scattered right across the whole of this village. Right. And then gradually drift together, and they would be in tune. Mm -hmm. they, some stuff would be slightly out, but it would be in tune. Yes. That was you starting off in tune. Yes. And it was only... Uh, the fine points after that. So, in common with Big Ronnie, who went a wee bit deaf, uh, what a character he was, what a great musician he was. Uh, he went, Ronnie went a wee bit deaf, and in fact, my teacher told me, Angus Campbell, when I was a kid, he said, uh, I have to tell you that maybe one day you might suffer some deafness in one of your ears. There some, seems to be some resonance that comes off the drones that actually accept, affects the calcification of the bones in the eardrum. Correct. So, uh, Ronnie had this, and then Ian got it. Ian was, I mean, you could speak to Ian, and he would say, what was that? Uh, you could actually detect something about there. Anyway, some years later down the road, he went for an operation. He was telling me, about, I went to see the doctor, Scotty, and yep. he did all this sound checks on my head and stuff like that, and he said, I've definitely got a wee bit of deafness, so we'll give you a wee operation to fix that. So about a week or so after the operation, uh, I, was hold, I was running the band practice, and uh, Ian was need to play his pipes in case the pressure in the eardrum damaged the, the surgery. So I'd, I'll never forgive him for this, Alan, do you know that? I'll never forgive him for this. Uh, after we played for wee while, he says, hey, just come here a minute, Scotty. I said, what, what is it? He said, uh, has the band always been as loud as that? <laughs> and I said, yeah, this is our trademark. We've, we've, we're the big sound. We have, people are killing themselves trying to reproduce. Okay. I mean, we were blowing reeds that were like the, the top of this table tied together as blades and they would aye, kill aye. you, absolutely. absolutely. And, and I was young and fit and strong and they would aye. kill you. You played one read for months to actually get it to free up. Greg and McLeod, two hernias. Aye, that's right. And that's what, people don't understand this. And it was all because he was deaf. 
<laughs> after after he said after he said to me, I, I didn't realise it was it's a band always been like that. Aye, that's our trademark. He said to me, and you'll remember the band. Oh, I remember. Oh, I flattened the grass with right. the sound. Aye. 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 He thought Aye. he thought that we actually sounded like the Edinburgh Police Pipe Band that won five champions, five world championships. Can you hear them behind the bus that's ticket? Lovely, soft, sweet sound. Aye, aye, we were all killing yourself because he couldn't hear what we were doing. <laughs> I was absolutely, to use a quick Glasgow expression, I was raging. Aye, aye. Years of suffering because he was. So, what, what size are you? You were playing sheepskin at that aye. time, and you were, of course, you were playing the, the cane, drones, and all the rest. Of it. Can you describe to me the instrument that you were playing and the, how did you change to Sinklers and all that sort of stuff? Actually, the, the change to Sinklers, I had a similar experience. Uh, you better explain to the listener what Sinklers are because two two hundred years down the, the line, they would say, "What is this? It's a chanter, a Sinkler chanter." Well, well, listeners, <laughs> the, the, technically, the chanter comes from the word to chant to sing, and that's what produces a melody for the bagpipe. The holy grail of bagpipers was to produce the best chanter that ever existed, and to this day, they're still trying to do it, dear leaders. Yes. In the field of musical experimentation, they just try so hard. And to be fair to them, uh, generally they make progress. There's always a wee thing that happens. But uh, the Sinclair Chanters, <coughs> before that, Ian uh, was playing, he just did the Glasgow Police Pipe Band, and I think they were probably playing Granger and Campbell Chanters. Hardys. Hardys. Yeah. I wondered about that because uh, yeah, I, I knew that the guys... At the time, I Granger was, Campbell, 65, he switched to Hardy's uh, 66, 67. Right. Because I knew that the, the guys went into Granger's shop, because I went into Granger's yeah. shop. George Granger was my pal, a guy that I played with in the band. Hardy's for about two years. Uh, uh, not a great success. Uh, not too bad. Uh, I would have denigrated it. was okay. Mm. But they found Hardy's was better, but a different sound for a right. different era. Yeah. Uh, the, the great attraction, of course, to going to Granger's shop was Donald McLeod. Of course. Absolutely fabulous musician, lovely guy, great sense of humour. Couldn't do enough for you, whatever it was. Great generosity, you know, that's the thing about Pipers, don't appreciate that. They're free with their time, they're free with the help that they give. Uh, and sometime later, when uh, we were trying McCallum chanters, uh, when I got the band, we had McCallum chanters, which I think were plastic ones. Well, I started off with the, the Mark I McCallum, uh, which uh, Plunkett took a uh, delivery of. Yeah. When when I took the band on, then we had the plastic ones. And I was talking to Stuart about it one day and he said, look, Jim, if you want wooden chanters, we can give you them and you can try them to see what it's like. And I did that and the whole sound changed. The whole sound changed. And that's exactly what happened to Ian. Yeah. When regionalisation came along in 1975 <coughs> and the Lanarkshire pipe band was dis disbanded, yes, uh, they had Sinclair chanters. Yes, I heard that story. And uh -huh. Ian fell heir to these Sinclair chanters. Yes. And that's what, just by a sheer stroke of luck, misfortune for the Lanarkshire band to go, the sheer stroke of luck was that he inherited these Sinclair chanters. Yeah. And, and uh, that was the basis for the next well, 20 15 years, years 20 years, yeah. wasn't it? <coughs> yeah. And the fascinating thing about <coughs> that is that uh, he'd inherited these things. They were what he wanted. And what you said is actually right. Uh, whether it's Hardy's or Granger and Campbell or Sinclair or Warnock or whatever, Chanter, they're all good chanters. Yes. The difference is it's what you want as an individual that you have all these choices to make. It's the sound that you're choosing right, to right. exhibit. With a combination of reeds that you're going to use. Yes. So we had these um, uh, chanters, uh, and in fact John McAllister learned to make reeds off of Willie Sinclair. Right. And that's, we actually ended up playing McAllister reeds with the Sinclair chanters. And they were huge reeds. Oh, they would kill you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, when you were talking about Gregor having two hernias, it's not the first time I was actually playing at a band practice and felt the wee ping in my groin and thought... About to go, yeah, boy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh -huh. And I was young and fit and strong. Mm. I'd climbed mountains and cycled and 
football and swam and did all these things. So I, I could, I was pretty fit and I could handle it, but all of us felt the same way. And you were putting so much effort into it that your sinuses in your head would be sore with the, the, the effort you were putting into it. And the funny thing was, nobody would give up. No. You wouldn't be the first. No. To stop playing. Just, no, you just kept going. You kept going because no, nobody else stopped. How long were Ian's band practices? There were two hours in general, but it was it was two hours of work. Was it a two hours work? It, oh, it wasn't right. it's far from about or anything no, like no, that. No, no. It was a, a, a heavy two hours. A typical of him, as you said earlier on, there was no flamboyance about right. him. There was no arrogance about him. Mm -hmm. Ian was there to do a job. So if the practice was at 3.15, for argument's sake, everybody arrived there at 3.15. By 3.20, the pleasantries were over okay. and we were playing our instruments. Absolutely. Jim, we discussed, uh, just, and I would like you to develop the idea about the work ethic where uh, Ian McClellan tried to get the band working hard and working together in order to prepare the band for World Pipe Band Championships? Well, as I said, Ian was a very practical guy. The job had to get done. Um, it was very down to earth about it all. So he knew, for example, that the simple things that we know, if you want to get it good at something, you have to practice it. So he would make us all practice it. We'd sit around a table with the practice chanters and he was the first person, I think I, I might be wrong on this because I was still fairly young at the time. But he's one of the few people that I knew as a pipe major who actually get the drummers involved in the practice session as well. And him and Alec Connell spent a lot of time uh, working on what their plans were. A thing that's missed a lot in uh, ensembles is the collaboration between the various groups. Uh, Alan Hamilton otherwise known as Jonas Brahms, wrote great symphonies, and you wrote everybody's part. So everybody played Brahms's music. Correct. In a pipe band, I'm the pipe major, and I hear a tune that somebody else has written, but mm -hmm. I think might be quite good for us. So then I say, right, Alan, you're the leading drummer, that's what we're playing this year. I'll be and write some stuff for it. So I, I don't actually know what you're going to do with that. I could put a kettle of fish. That's right. So the collaboration between people in the pipe band, because you don't always write the music. I, once again, I was dead lucky from the point of view that uh, Alec Connell was just great at ensemble. Uh, really, that's what he did. Sterling McMurtry, Jimmy McGeeky, Bob Edmiston, all these people in the, the drum corps, John Kennedy. Uh, they all worked hard mm -hmm. at ensemble about getting it to make yes. the thing sound as good as it can. Yes. And that's a big issue that we have now. Mm -hmm is that uh, bands are becoming more like orchestras and not pipes and drums anymore. Everybody has a role to play in that. And all the, the work that we did at the practices was gauged towards one good performance, the one that counted. We knew, that we learned things like, I, I've listened to pipe bands over the years when we were achieving so much. I would listen to them in the tuning field and I think, well, that's just super, absolutely fantastic. There's no way we can do better than that. But often what happened was they left their best performance out in the training field. Training field, yes. Didn't we, translate no, it. We, we were able to do field. that, yeah. And what we would do is, <clears throat> particularly in preparation for a world championship, uh, we would, Ian would say things like, uh, at quarter past three, we're delivering our best performance at a practice. So everything would be gauged towards at quarter past three. We're on now. This is it. We're doing it. By the right, quick march. And this was our World Championship performance. Okay. And if it didn't work in the practice field, mm -hmm. how are you going to expect it to work when you're under pressure at the World Championship? Correct. So everything he did was gauged towards that. A thing that's probably uh, disappearing now is the inherited skills that you got from people like you and for Ian about the types of instruments that you played. For example, as we touched on earlier on, the reeds that we blew were just enormously strong to blow. And we found that the only way to actually do that was with a bigger bag. Because the amount of air pressure that you had to put into it, if you had a wee bag when you were squeezing, you were losing that air pressure very quickly. 
the bigger bag you had more of a reservoir, and while you were actually killing yourself to do it, there was respite between blowing and squeezing. But with a wee bag, you didn't have that sort of backup. The air went very quickly. Ronnie Laurie had a huge bag. Oh, do you know what? birth to Queen Mary. That's right, it? that's right. I mean, all the sheep in the Highlands were obviously worried about when it was coming up for time to run and get a new bag because <laughs> it was essentially take the legs off it and we'll just stick the drones in there. Uh, it once played my pipes in uh, uh, an army club and he put everything under his arm, drones and everything, all he was left with was a chant of a blow stick, everything else was under his arm, <laughs> just enormous. Uh, the thing about the, these instruments in those days, because they were pretty much natural, in fact, a guy who wasn't a piper used the word uh, organic okay. to me, mm -hmm. and he wasn't talking about organic from the organ sound, he was talking about how it naturally developed. Even when you started playing your pipes, it would be 10 or 15 minutes before they were really where you wanted them to be sound-wise. Yes. And he talked about this sort of organic growth of the sound with the mm -hmm. instrument, which I found quite interesting that he should come up with that, because I never thought about it, and I play the thing. But what actually is missing now is the things that you knew when you were playing a natural instrument. You knew, like... I'm sure it was Willie Ross said in the 30s that the way to make reeds last was to keep them as dry as possible. But you and I both know that for the reeds that make the chanters work, a wee bit of moisture is essential for them to vibrate properly. And working with these things like the cane drone reeds, uh, you had to check the, how hard they were all the time because they soaked up moisture. Yes. And if they get soft at all, <coughs> then their ability to sustain sound disappeared. And... The most critical thing for a piper anyway, and probably it's the same for the drummers when they strike the drum head for the first time, is at the World Championship the pipe major says, quick march. After the word march, you go through the terror of, am I going to hit this bag and my drones are all going to work at the same time? Aye, and are they going to, going to the single phase instead of the second phase Aye. and stick there and get roaring drones Aye. and the many pipe band world championships have been ruined. By Buy Sunday's that. bass drone roar. By that. And I had, um, for a, a long time, I played a set of uh, Henderson pipes, uh, which was a good instrument, but I then had McDougal's as well. Uh, and people have said things sometimes about McDougal's that uh, can have caused me a wee bit of bother from the point of view that I've heard folks saying, like, no, every set of pipes McDougal made was special. But probably no every violin that Stradivarius or Guarnarius made was special, but some of them were. Aye. And it was the special ones is what you're looking for. Of course. So the fact that they sometimes made in different bagpipes is of no consequence to me. Aye. Everybody made in different bagpipes, but from time to time it was the wood, that piece of wood that was different. Yes. Not how it was made, not the dimensions. Aye. It was a quality, that bit of wood that made all the difference. Providing the true resonance. Yes, yes, Aye. that's absolutely right. So you had, you had to think about all these things, right. about the proper management of the instrument. Nowadays, uh, well, the instruments are pretty much stable all the time because of the amount of synthetic material that's in them, the moisture control mechanisms that are available. I have to say, from the point of view of teaching youngsters how to play the bagpipes, this is fantastic because you don't have anything to worry about. If later on in their life they, they believe and it's a perception thing again, as you said, that if they believe later on that cane reeds in a sheepskin bag and uh, all that stuff is going to give them the sound they want, then that's fine. But for the point of view of teaching young people, what we have is great. And now I'm, I'm pretty much uh, convinced that it's really quite hard to beat the synthetic setup from my point of view because you don't have all the variables that you had with the, the natural instrument. That's correct. And with the natural instrument, for example, uh, and once again, this, this is all the experience, experiences that folk are unlikely ever to have again. One of the McAllister reeds that I played, that sh which was a killer, uh, was so good a reed. I, had a, I think I won two world championships with it. These reeds lasted that length of time. Mm -hmm. But the reed was so good, that, and I knew it so well, and this is the thing, knowing what you're doing so well, that uh, the reed would let me know when my bag needed seasoning because I'd be playing it and then suddenly it just goes slightly sharp. 
Okay. And I knew then that the moisture level in my bag had just changed enough for it had to be restored. Right. And then what people didn't realise, because it was that kind of thing you did, you had to use particular types of seasoning, as they say, to dress the leather from the inside to keep it in good shape, because it didn't last forever. Mm -hmm. Two or three years, uh, you'd be doing well to get two or three years. The amount of playing that we did... Get a couple of seasons and just right. change uh, the bag. The bag, because yeah. then you started to... It might get, the skin might get develop... Uh, into being porous where the moisture leaked out and yeah. then that contained more moisture which affected the reeds and it was just a chain reaction. Yes. And when, whenever you had to uh, look after the, the bag or the reeds, it was a case of stripping the whole instrument down, drying it all out and then starting all over again because once you had done that, once you'd seasoned the bag and put it all together, you were back to square one because it had to come back up to the kind of sound that you were looking for and that didn't happen like that. But my bagpipe just now, if I can say it, uh, I could get it out the the box and play it, and I'd be perfectly happy with the way it's sounding. Mine also, mm -hmm. after one tune, simply because I've got a synthetic bag. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got a cane bass. I've got synthetic drones and uh, the valves synthetic. Yeah. Everything synthetic, yeah. and you can leave them for a week yeah. and go back, take them out the box, and play them. Yeah. Couldn't do that in these days. You'd well, I mean, constantly blow your instrument, keep it moisturised if you the, wish. The nightmare, the leather valve. Oh. Leather valve. If you left your pipes for a week, this was like a, a manhole cover by the time you got it and tried to make it work. <laughs> it was like steel and you had to you had to learn that I haven't played my pipes for a week because I've been on holiday. I've got a practice on Tuesday. You had to know how much effort you had to put in for the next few days to be up to the mark for a Tuesday practice. Plus, your, your drones could be turning in the stocks and the bag, oh, or I, a dry I, bag I, and I, all this sort I, of stuff. I, I never dreamt for a minute when I was 11 years old and had a chest complaint and the guy in the BB said, would you like to learn to play the pipes? I never dreamt that I would travel the world. Yeah. I never dreamt that I would meet film stars, pop stars, heads of governments, kings and queens. Uh, learn bits of foreign languages. How many countries have you been in? Did you ever count? Well, I've not been to South America. No? No. Okay, right. That's easier for me to say than to uh, try and think about all the places. Been to China? I nearly went to China. Uh, Didn't quite get there. Been to but you, you were over in Malay and all ah, this. Malaysia, Indonesia, Malaysia. Japan. Yeah. All these, these places. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And the good thing, the fascination for me was, because I'm such a pathetic, sad individual, was the impact I had on your instrument. Aye. Malaysia, uh, the, the atmosphere when we were there at that time was fabulous. Pipes just sang. It was the right combination of moisture, humidity mm -hmm. and temperature in there. It was, there was no bother at all. And then you'd come back from these places, go to your next band practice and be losing air and you discover that the dry atmosphere had shrunk the wood, taken the moisture out of it, so the joints were loose and stuff like that. For goodness sake. So I, a wee trick I learned then was, Aye. for anybody who's still playing a natural bag, if they've been to a hot country and come back again, is to stick a damp towel in your pipe case and shut the lid and leave it for a couple of days. Just to allow it to all Get the cover. moisture, take it back into the wood. Yeah. But you see, these are the things... The things that you were constantly working at about your trade. Yes, of course. To be on the ball all the time. There's no point in turning up to a band practice with Ian McClellan and say to him, uh, I'm losing air or my stocks are turning. That would be totally unacceptable for him because he did the job and he expected you, you to do to the do job. It. And he expected everybody to be professional enough to realise that they had to be on the ball and get everything up and running without him instructing you. Yeah. He, he touched on Malaysia there a second ago. I understand the band played in number one uniform That's there. right, that's and right. I, I, maybe describe that to experience. I, I, I can't, it's too horrible for me to look what, at it. It's like one of these... What nightmares. is number one uniform? Nobody plays in number one uniform now. Number one uniform is... Uh, the, if you like, the ceremonial dress that Pipers in the army wore because the history of piping in this country, the Great Highland Bagpipe, was pretty much like other folk instruments. 
Nobody dressed up for it. It was just an instrument you played. And it was only probably uh, through the formalisation of clan groups and family names and the Victorian interest in Scottish culture that developed this Highland dress thing that we have now. Okay. But when you're, when you're wearing this, in Malaysia, I was wearing my kilt, which was made of solid wool right. and was about 15 metres of fabric wrapped around me. I was wearing uh, my finest leather brogues, uh -huh. which obviously the, the leather came from some sort of uh, animal that they had to kill with a tank. The leather was so tough. Aye. Underneath that, of course, I would have woolen leg dress. Uh -huh. And on top of that, nice white cotton spats to keep the thing looking nice and to keep the mud out when you were trudging through the battlefields and stuff like that. Aye. But and there then, weren't too many battlefields. No, 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 no. That was the same. Yeah, you that was, that was what you did. Aye. And then you had this lovely ceremonial horsehair sporing, uh -huh. which weighed half a ton. Right. And then a beautiful woolen tunic. Aye, which weighed two tons. Yes. And then you had these nice big heavy belts. And best of all, the plaid. Plaid. Lovely. Uh, if you ever were another hundred yards of tap. Yeah, if you were ever cold hiding under a plaid as a way place to be, because that's what the Highlanders did in the old days, that's where the kilt came from. And then your feather bonnet. Aye, but now we were actually walking about with a kilt that was developed from the plaid, and a plaid that was used to develop the kilt, we were wearing aye, that. Aye. And then this feather bonnet, made from ostrich feathers. And weighing, weighing very, very, several pounds. Very, very <laughs> little compared to the rest of it, but see the heat that that retained, boy, that was the stuff. I weighed myself at once. It got on two stones or something. Uh, like that, well, you know. I, I knew that whenever uh, I went, whenever whenever you were going anywhere, obviously there was a weight allowance in the plane, and you knew that by the time you put your kit into it, you'd probably taken up about uh, nearly thirty pounds. Aye. Of your allowance would be that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was something that you just had to put up with the fact. Now remember, this is all designed for the freezing cold of the north. We're in Malaysia playing this. Thing. Temperature. Biling. <laughs> and what what actually annoyed me was we were playing at a garden festival and uh, the job, after we stopped playing, we were there with the, like, the Malaysian police bands and all right. these folk had learned to play the bagpipes and the drums. And uh, the jolly old chaps were walking about with their uh, cotton blazers, right. drinking ice cold pims and stuff like that. Yeah. And underneath my kilt there was this raging furnace. Not kidding, not kidding, raging furnace, just absolutely built up temperature. There was no breeze, nothing. You just had to stand there, having done the performance, and wait till the jolly old chaps had had enough and went home. Right. Amazing. Uh, absolutely well, really, amazing. and I remember once being in Canada and wearing a number one dress, and when I took my feather bonnet off, it actually took a layer of skin off my forehead. Dear, dear. A I heard a, a funny story, and I like to, well, funny to me, uh, interesting story about your experience uh, with the Strathclyde Place Pipe Band in Moscow. What happened there, the, the crowds in the, the square? It's a fascinating place, you know. Fascinating place, the history of it. Um, although the geography of Europe has changed a great deal since either of the great wars. Um, people in these countries don't forget very easily what they've been through. Uh, one of the things that we saw was the, the bit of the railway track in Moscow, which was where the German army, army was stopped as it advanced towards Moscow. This is something for them to remember. Uh, then you get shown the spaceships, the things they sent up into Spending. the... Yeah. And, and, actually, and they've recovered them, got them back and restored them, so you're actually looking at the, the real deal that went up there and flew around the world. Um, but when I was speaking to uh, the people there, it was the cultural thing was fascinating because they were great believers in what they had done and what they'd achieved. And yet even with that um, kind of equality, there was still inequality mm -hmm. in operation. Um, but some of the things that happened, for example, uh, we were there to celebrate uh, Moscow's 800th birthday, I think it was. Okay. And uh, St. George is the patron saint of Moscow. But it's Yuri in 
Russian. Mm -hmm. So right away, because of my stupid mind, I'm going like, wow, this is like really mind expanding. I thought Britain was the only place. England had St George and we've got one here in Russia, but it's called Yuri. Then I discovered in various parts of Europe they've all got a St George. And some places actually have them doing the dragon thing as well. On the day of its birth, of the birthday, we, we walked through uh, Moscow. In fact, it was probably at the time, round about the time that uh, Princess of Wales had died. Okay. And um, I think it was, I think Harry actually might have played a lament for her on the streets of Moscow at the request of the public. Mm -hmm. uh, and everywhere we went, along the streets, it was... For anybody who's ever been at a football match and heard a huge crowd roaring at a goal being scored, this was our experience. Everywhere we went, along the streets, there was this huge roar and it was just like Hamden, with an international football match going on, it was so loud. And we discovered later on that there were um, the police reckoned there was like 12 million people on the streets of Moscow that day just to that celebration. For goodness sake. And of course what they'd done is they'd invited uh, groups from everywhere. Culturally, it's hard to criticise the, the Russians and the Soviet system that they had because of their cultural interests that from all over the world. They were just so interested in everything and tried to learn so much. And... Um, when we were getting ready for the parade, uh, we all got our pipes out and I, I was uh, playing away and I heard this uh, band from uh, Northern Africa playing, but it was a percussion band and they were beating their drums. And actually the, I realised that the rhythm was just enough to fit into scarce tatties. Okay. So while they were rattling away at their drums, I pipes up and walked towards them and started playing. And they're like, hey, this is really good, you know. And I, it was a great thrill for me because Aye. what people uh, don't realise about music sometimes is that although you're a piper, or although you're a, a guitar player or whatever, tempo and rhythm and expression and these things and phrasing and all that stuff is common throughout music. Okay. Wherever you go, the music might be a bit foreign to you, but these things still happen. Uh, so we did that, these guys were astonished, I loved every minute of it, when I stopped playing they gave me a big cheer and shook my hands and all the rest of it and said stuff in a foreign language that I didn't understand, but I kind of hope it was you guys from Glasgow are good at the pipes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and at the end of the parade we had to go uh, march through part of uh, the square outside the Kremlin. And we actually had to get a police escort because people just wouldn't let us move. We were playing and we were just surrounded. Just mobbed. Just surrounded, they wouldn't let us through. And uh, they had to get us through it. And one of the things that did amuse me at the time was uh, we were staying in the Moskva Hotel, which is actually just across the street from the Kremlin. And every floor had a wee receptionist. And uh, when I went into my room, the window had been left open and there was a seagull sitting on the table beside the window. So I went, back to, I went back to the receptionist to explain to her there was a bird sitting on the table in my room. Aye. So she said, stupid foreigner. Because you weren't a tourist, you were a foreigner. Uh, and I'm so I just dragged her along and opened the window and the seagull was sitting there. And in Russian she shouted, get out of here. And the bird took off and then she looked to me as if to say, you're an idiot. Why could you not That's right. that? <laughs> I walked uh, yes. away. I'm, I'm sure it was because the seagull only understood Russian that she was able to communicate Aye. so effectively. So it was a homing pigeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, but it is. It made us actually, obviously, they're... they work harder. Aye. We've got to show them. And our attitude was that anybody who puts a second, folk will be saying, what did you do that for? That band was super. Mm -hmm. It was never a case of giving up. It was always digging deeper. Yes. Uh, and what happened was we won the World Championship that year. We'd won no competitions up until then. We were always in the prizes, but we went in and won the World Championship. Great. Now, if anybody had been looking at maybe Bob Colin Bathgate or perhaps even Shots uh, to win the World Championship on the basis of the results, but we won it because we never gave up. And you've been in the preparation for all the, the time, day. Aye, yeah. all the time, and that's what it was about. Every competition we went to was actually like that, so that when when Ian retired as a pipe major after so many years of success, and at the end of the at the end of his tenure, things the success of the band was tailing off. We were never out of the prize list, but the high level of success uh, had gone. Uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, Simon Fraser University. Uh, St. Lawrence or Toolpipe band were beginning to come up as well. Great band just coming to yeah. business now. So the band went through a period of uh, low morale, team spirit was down, and uh, it was very hard for the guys who had it, Harry and Ian, to, to get it up and running again. So when I get the job, uh, I just told everybody, there are several things that you need to know. First of all is, that there's so much you all have to learn to do and remember to do that I'm not going to tell you what the list is. The list is so extensive it would put you off. That's my job. I'll manage the list of things to do and I'll tell you when you need to do them. But one of the things I said to them all was, there's no point in you standing in a corner somewhere amongst yourselves talking about how bad I am as a pipe major. If you've got an issue with me being a pipe major, if you don't think I'm up to the job, if you don't think I'm doing it properly, then it's unprofessional of you to not come and tell me what you think. Correct. I'm, I'm big enough to take it. Mm -hmm. uh, bring forward suggestions for change, suggestions for music and all the rest of it. I'm in charge and I will make decisions. Some of you will be pleased about them and some of you won't be pleased about them. But that's the way it is. It has to be like that for me to make this work if it's going to work at all. And you were successful fairly quickly, yeah. and I thought because you won the it was a British Championship, yeah. Yeah. Lockery. Yeah, I was there. Uh, That's right. I remember you were. I was standing out in the field along with the local councillor, a, a, a provost or whatever. So I used him to get right onto the field, right close up to the band, yeah. as, as usual, sneaked on, and yeah. uh, as a fantastic performance. Aye. It was. Something that uh, changes in leadership can uh, have different effects, and but the one most important effect is a positive effect. You must have that. And if it means changing things, for example, probably uh, all during the time of all the pipe majors before I got the job, I would make suggestions about music. I would actually, they would pick music, and I would maybe rearrange it for them to make it what I thought was better for the job. But all of the time, I knew that the collaboration aspect of it had to work. Yes. So when I became the pipe major and uh, Eric Ward eventually became <clears throat> the leading drummer, uh, the collaboration between us, I think, was really good. I think so. Uh, never uh, too many issues between no. uh, drummers and pipers. No. And I thought you managed it very well. Well, I, I think so, but I think... Uh, a big Is that the old heat again? I, I think so, I. Uh, but I think it goes back to what you said earlier on about uh, Ian. Ian just did the job. Aye. There was nothing fancy about it. And I tended to be like that, I think. But what I wanted to do was make everybody realise that I wasn't afraid to take criticism off anybody. If they had something to say, waste the time telling your pal in the corner of the field somewhere. Tell me. But you were foxy enough to be inclusive uh, in as much as you did invite opinions to be expressed all the time, mm -hmm. uh, immediately after playing a set, you would come over and uh, invite somebody to express an opinion, and you're still foxy enough to be polite enough and say thanks very much, and uh, I'll take that under consideration. And uh, for me, so, uh, and, and knowing full well that I'd probably been talking a lot of rubbish anyway, and uh, but you were polite enough to say hey, that's a good point, and uh, uh, just let it wash over you and go on with whatever you to do in mm. life. But um, 
you'd effectively got these folk on side yeah. and kept them on side because you allowed them to express a view. Definitely. Which yeah. is lost with a, a lot of guys who just can't kind of manage people and really being pipe major is, uh, is managing people right. in a group. That's right. And That's I think right. you did it very, very effectively. Um, I think I think that um, one of the biggest issues for folk is uh, feeling as if they're worth something. As individuals, you feel as if you're worth, worth something. It's that uh, what I'm doing is valuable. Yes. If you don't give people the feeling that they're making a contribution, then at some stage they'll think, well, he doesn't care, so I won't make it. Just effort walk away. Aye. And. So they don't walk away physically, they walk away no, mentally. Mentally. And that's the worst. You would rather, you would rather they would say, uh, I'm off, and slam the door as they leave. But it's uh, when they walk off mentally. Uh, you've uh, lost uh, it. You've lost it because it's that. And they're not putting focus. in the effort. No. And you got a downgrading of all the input yeah. and the preparation and everything else. And they're only doing as little as they need just to, to get, get by. by. And that's no use. You have to be no, to active. Yeah. towards your objective. But every man in that group's got yeah. to be active. One yeah. of the things that... Uh, my whole life has just been like a learning curve, and one of the things that I came to admire was the fact that, that the Roman Empire was so spread out all over Europe, North Africa and Asia. Yet the local commanders of these outposts were loyal to the Roman cause. Mm -hmm. Did everything they could. Yeah. When they could quite happily, thousands of miles from Rome, sit back, put the TV on, make a cup of coffee, no worry too much about yeah, it. Because there wouldn't have too many uh, TV sets or that's cameras right. or that's right. mobiles or whatever yeah, satellites. That's right. I mean, and I mean, so they actually, all the time, mm -hmm. all the time they were committed to the cause. And, and it's a commitment. That's, that's right. what you're looking for. That's what you're looking time. for, yeah. And that's what you're trying to eke out of people consistently, constantly. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when you stop getting that commitment, that's when you start losing. Yeah. But fortunately, you were building up that commitment, and uh, your successors, uh, I think, to a yeah. great extent, carried I like to that on. Yeah. Uh, and because um, Donald taking over from me as a pipe major, yeah. just sustained what was going on, yeah. and he got the success as well. Aye, it's simply because he'd viewed what was going on, and there was folks enough just to continue in a similar vein, you know. Yeah. Albeit maybe a slightly different style, but not not too much. Mm -hmm. And you were successful fairly quickly. Yeah. And, and I thought because you won the it was a British Championship, yeah. Yeah. Lockery. Yeah, I was there. Uh, That's right. I remember you were. I was standing out in the field along with the local councillor, a, a, a provost or whatever. So I used him to get right onto the field, right close up to the band, yeah. as, as usual, sneaked on, and yeah. they, as a fantastic performance. Uh, it was something that uh, changes in leadership can uh, have different effects, and but the one most important effect is a positive effect. You must have that. And if it means changing things, for example, probably uh, all during the time of all the pipe majors before I got the job, I would make suggestions about music. I would actually, they would pick music and I would maybe rearrange it for them to make it what I thought was better for the job. But all of the time, I knew that the collaboration aspect of it had to work. Yes. So when I became the pipe major, and uh, Eric Ward eventually became <clears throat> the leading drummer, uh, the collaboration between us, I think, was really good. I think so. Never too many issues between no. uh, drummers and pipers. No. And I thought you managed it very well. Well, I, I think so, but I think... Uh, a big, Is that the old heat again? I, I think so, aye. aye. But I think it goes back to what you said earlier on about uh, Ian. Ian just did the job. Aye. There was nothing fancy about it. And I tended to be like that, I think. But what I wanted to do was make everybody realise that I wasn't afraid to take criticism off anybody. If they had something to say... Waste of time telling your pal in the corner of the field somewhere. Tell me. But you were foxy enough to be inclusive uh, in as much as you did invite opinions to be expressed all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, immediately after playing a set, you would come over and uh, invite somebody to express an opinion. 
and they're still fancy enough to be polite enough and say thanks very much and they I'll take that under consideration and uh, for me is, um, and, and knowing full well that I'd probably been talking a lot of rubbish anyway and uh, but you were polite enough to say that's a good point and uh, uh, just let it wash over you and go on with whatever you to do in your mm. life but um, you'd effectively got these folk on side yeah. and kept them on side because you allowed them to express a view definitely which is lost with a, a lot of guys who just can't kind of manage people and really being pipe major is uh, is managing people right. in a group that's right and that's I think right. you did it very very effectively um I think I think that um, one of the biggest issues for folk is uh, feeling as if they're worth something. As individuals, you feel as if you're worth worth something. It's that uh, what I'm doing is valuable. Yes. If you don't give people the feeling that they're making a contribution, then at some stage they'll think, well, he doesn't care, so I won't make. Just effort walk away. Aye. And. So they don't walk away physically, they walk away no, mentally. Mentally. And that's the worst. You would rather, you would rather they would say, uh, I'm off, and slam the door as they leave. But it's uh, when they walk off mentally. Uh, you've uh, lost it. Uh, you've lost it because it's that. And they're not putting focus. in the effort. No. And you got a downgrading of all the input yeah. and the preparation and everything else. And they're only doing as little as they need just to, to get, get by. by. And that's no use. You have to be no, to active. Yeah. towards your objective. But every man in that group's got yeah. to be active. One yeah. of the things that... Uh, my whole life has just been like a learning curve, and one of the things that I came to admire was the fact that, that the Roman Empire was so spread out all over Europe, North Africa and Asia. Yet the local commanders of these outposts were loyal to the Roman cause. Mm -hmm. Did everything they could. Yeah. When they could quite happily, thousands of miles from Rome, sit back, put the TV on, make a cup of coffee, no worry too much about yeah, it. Because there wouldn't have too many uh, TV sets or that's cameras right. or that's right. mobiles or whatever yeah, satellites. That's right. I mean, and I mean, so they actually, all the time, mm -hmm. all the time they were committed to the cause. And, and it's a commitment. That's, that's right. what you're looking for. That's what you're looking time. for, yeah. And that's what you're trying to eke out of people consistently, constantly. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when you stop getting that commitment, that's when you start losing. Yeah. But fortunately, you were building up that commitment and uh, your successors, uh, I think, to a yeah. great extent, carried I like to that think on. Because yeah. uh, um, Donald taking over from me as a pipe major yeah. just sustained what was going on yeah. and he got the success as well. Aye, it's simply because he'd viewed what was going on and there was folks enough just to continue in a similar vein, you know. Yeah. Albeit maybe a slightly different style, but not not too much. Mm -hmm. I would like if you could just tell me about how you wanted the band to express, say, for a uh, instance, March the Space and Reels, and maybe it, it talked to me just for a second or two about two four marches. What was your ethic? What was a, what was your guiding principle and the expression of a two four march? Uh, with the Strathclyde Police Pipe Band? Well, important thing is that uh, you have to be able to imagine, see in your mind. Before we competed, I used to sit in, on the bus when we got there and imagine the performance before we started. Sometimes uh, leaders will get up and they'll say, now, before we go and do this, remember this, remember that, oh, and back to that one, remember to add this as well, and oh, don't forget to do this, so that... Actually, before you do the job, people are thinking about things that they might have to do without actually getting on with the job. But you as the leader, you have to take care of these issues, so why burden other people with that when you can keep an eye on it? You know what to look for, so you keep an eye on it. Don't ask other people to do it. And uh, I remember Eric and I talking about this one day, and uh, there's a great story about Thomas Beecham, the great conductor, who was doing a, a performance with a brilliant lady soprano singer, and he said to her, so how would you like it today, dear? Too fast or too slow? And Eric and I talked about this, and we went for, if you're going to be criticised, let's be criticised for being too fast and not too slow. Ah, that's so that interesting. It was, yeah, so that it was always lively. And one, one of the, the kind of things that people don't often think about is 
what the projected idea is. And one of my favourite examples of that is the Balmoral Highlanders. Okay. When you play the Balmoral Highlanders, just start the tune. Reasonable tempo. Okay. Get to the part where it goes. Same tempo. Lifeless. Absolutely. Lifeless. Yeah, dead. Dead in the water. Yeah. So what you have to think about is, how do I want that part to sound? Yeah. So you want the part to sound like this. So when you're getting the band to go, you start off at that tempo. Okay. People listening to that, their initial impression might be, here. Yeah, that's a bit quick. But when you get to but the... But once they settle into uh, the middle of the tune, it's, 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 fine. it's fine. It's fine. And that's what people don't often, often understand about things like rhythm and tempo and relative note values. I, when I, I've done a lot of teaching uh, uh, because I love talking to people about music. I don't lecture to people about music. I try to open doors for people about music. And it's a fascinating process when folk suddenly realise, oh, so that's what that is. Uh, and one of the big issues for me is where uh, pipe majors pick music that they haven't discussed with the, the leading drummer and they're going to make it work. Now just imagine me, old-fashioned Jim, taking a Balmoral Highlanders and that's a tempo that my great-great-grandfather played it at. Okay. And the, the leading drummer then has to write something for a third, a fourth part, third part oh, that's going da 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 Dreadful. Dreadful. Ah. So that's a great issue for me and what people have to do is think ahead all the time ah. about where they want the performance to be. Not where it's starting, where is it going to arrive. Mid performance. Yes. And folk Which don't... is engrossing time for the judge. Yeah, that's right, because ah. they've, heard, they've got the impact. Yeah. They're waiting to see what's happening after that. Right. And I'm a great believer in accurate timekeeping. Uh, one of the things that I was going to say about that is uh, if you were a violin player and you got a job with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and you were sitting down to play um, something fairly simple like uh, a tune everybody knows, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. Da, 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 da. Now, pipers are taught when they're young, they're taught things like take the Balmoral Highlanders again. Mm -hmm. Strict timekeeping is... Strict timekeeping. Right. But unconsciously they'll be taught things like I exaggerate notes at the yes. end of phrases. Yes. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. when all these guys wrote great music, the right. Beatles, uh, Beethoven, Bach, Blondie, whoever it is, they didn't do any of that stuff. The notes spoke for themselves. So if you play the relative note values you're going to get the tune. And if you went to the Royal Philharmonic as a violin player playing Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and the conductor goes, right, Benny, da 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 da, and you're going, da 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 da, and everybody else is stopped, they'll say, what are you doing? Oh no, that's the way I was taught to play that. So he would then tell you to find another orchestra that plays it the way you did it. <laughs> and that's the way it is. And that's, that's a point for me that about Pipers that because of all the experiences and influences in my life Aye. as music, the most beautiful tunes I've ever heard are all played in time. Aye. With Aye. accurate relative note values. Yeah. So it's, it's sticking more near to the mathematics of the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Aye. And one of, one of the things, unfortunately, to like, the thing for, for me in piping is good strips bay playing. I think good strips bay playing is so difficult to do. There's and not too many folk can do that now. No. And lost that. And what I think also is, and I may be wrong in saying this, you could you could play good Peabrook for another thirty years. But at the end of that thirty years I'd like to see you trying to play a Strats Bay. Can you play one? No. No. It's too technical. It's too demanding. It is. The music itself is so demanding. Hardest tune. Yep. And so when I start to talk to people about Strats Bay play, and if I was talking to you about it as opposed to kids where I would just say, this is how you play the tune. Mm. Uh, for example, um, one great tune which was used a lot in my youth in the lower bands was the Caledonian Canal. Aye. Right. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't too technically demanding, a simple tune. What was the great pitfall? The pointing. Because it invariably it came out like this. Aye. 
when it should actually be played. Strict time, correct note values, and the life and the lifts in it there. Yes. But simple tunes are almost always the trap. Of course they are. Same with Peabrook. Aye. Simple tunes in Peabrook are the ones that are going to give you a problem. I always hated when they asked me to play the wee spree because I could never... <coughs> I could never work up the enthusiasm <laughs> and always thought uh, they picked the shortest one because they didn't want to hear me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's the thing, people think because it's a simple piece of music that it's easy to play. Aye. And it's not. That Caledonian canal played properly is quite difficult because you have to manufacture the rhythm in your mind. There's no grace notes, there's no round movements or GDEs or anything like that to help and you with it. And sustaining that through the four parts. Yep. That's a difficult yep. thing too. You enjoyed your time with Strathclyde Police Pipe Band. Uh, did you feel that you fulfilled yourself uh, band-wise anyway? Uh, oh, I think you have to say that. I yeah. think to ask for any more than what we got. Aye, that, aye. There was a time... Uh, this probably sounds a bit glib, but I mean it. For like a 10 or 12 year period, we totally dominated yeah. the pipe band world. Mm -hmm. So for 10 or 12 years, very good pipe majors and very good leading drummers and great pipers and great drummers didn't win anything. Because we were winning it all. Astonishing. Yeah. And I, I actually, I do honestly tell you, I did actually think about these poor souls. I mean, it was when we won five in a row, equaling what your heads had done. Just, wow, fantastic. I never thought it would happen. I never actually thought we would win two successive world championships. It's the, the first one, in some measure, must be the easiest one of the whole lot, and uh, the fifth one, and et cetera, and going on, is much more difficult to sustain. Psychologically, it's a big problem. Yeah, it is. Um, the likes of a... Uh, You've moved into, well, as I say moved in, that's, that's wrong. You've always been in the background of the Pipe Band Association and various committees, in particular music committees, as mm -hmm. I understand. You'll correct me here. Um, how did you get into that? And uh, what's your current position? Uh, a couple of minutes in that, please. I was dead lucky, once again. Um, because of my interest in music, I, the RSPBA ran exams. Uh, but it wasn't the exams that I was concerned about, it was what I would learn on the way to the exams. Uh, so I ended up with the advanced certificate, the highest award that they issue, which is, you ask anybody who's done this, and they'll tell you it's pretty demanding. Uh, so much so that you learn things about music that even some musicians don't know, because you're playing a folk instrument and you have to think about how that scale works with the standard scale. Um, so you learn about things that most musicians don't do. And as it happened, uh, at the time, the music board um, was represented on probably every meeting uh, with people from the branches so that they could take to this uh, music board the views of the people at the local level so that you get a sort of global idea. Okay. And... Um, I had just passed my advanced exam and people had noticed that and I didn't realise it but I was told one day, oh by the way Jim, you're now representing Glasgow and West of Scotland branch on the music board because they had picked me because I'd passed this exam. Okay. And fortunately John Kennedy, who's sadly no longer with us, him, John and I played, he was a flying drum in the band and I played right next to him. Yes. And that was one of the things that when we knew we'd come off and him and I had played together, we knew that probably the whole band performance was pretty good. Because it was a key position in yeah. any band. Again, I think it's lost in modern bands. Yeah, using ta the tactics of having your strengths at the right place. Correct. And uh, he came onto the music board uh, with me, and the various posts that are with the responsibilities, areas of responsibility were like grading bands, um, the one that I have been involved in for most of the time has been education. I was the chairman of the music board for a while, for several years. Uh, great experience. Unfortunate thing is that people imagine that this is some sort of elite group and actually you're sitting having conversations with people who are dead smart and know lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, good comes from it all the time. 
Good. And good debates come from it all the time. The people are in th they give up their own time to do these things. Yes. So I've been involved in education uh, as the chairman or the convener for education in the Pipe Band Association for quite a long time now. And we've recently moved into, um, you of course will be familiar with the Institute of Piping exams. Yes. All these things have been amalgamated now, the college, the National Piping Centre, the Army, RSPBA, the Peabrook Society, now into the Piping and Drumming Qualifications Board. Excellent. And that was, that's a lot of work by a lot of people to get that done. A lot of time. Yeah, and now the SQA have recognised these qualifications as well. It says a lot for the piping world that they can put aside their differences in their own individual organisations and they can come together like that definitely. to produce something yeah, of that nature, right. which is widely recognised, yeah. as you say, the SQA. Yeah. Judging, you're now uh, a judge, uh, and I'd like to know what your experience were in your early days of judges and what you, your opinion in, indeed was of the judges and uh, how you, you equate that uh, with your conduct uh, as being a judge these days. Well, one of the conclusions I've come to about being a judge is that Every day you leave after the competition, at least somebody's going to have a high regard for you because you put them first. <laughs> You're going to have one pal when you leave. Uh, you might have many people not happy with you. Uh, I think, to be honest with you, uh, probably from an early age, I accepted that judges are judges. Uh, the, fine, the most refined judgmental system we have is the criminal courts, and it doesn't always work out no. the way people would like it to be. Yeah. Uh, so I, I kind of, uh, I think probably one of the things that gets you over that is if you're successful, Alan. Yes. I think if you win prizes, then you know that some judges like you and some judges maybe don't like you or don't, don't like what you did or maybe Correct. you actually didn't perform as well as you thought you did. Uh, it's a very subjective. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have found everywhere I've gone and everybody I've spoken to you don't necessarily have to agree with them, but they always tell you about how they feel and what they think. And I don't know, I would find it hard to tell you, out of the, all the judges I know, how many of them don't think seriously about what they're doing and how many of them, when they get home that night, will sit and think about uh, whether they made the right thing, the right decision that day or not, it's because they all take it seriously. You enjoy judging? I do, I do, and I particularly enjoy judging. Um, it's pipe band judging, really, isn't it? Aye, well, I've done You've solos. You've done solos, but yeah. you're predominantly the yeah, band. Yeah, and I enjoy actually judging the lower grades the most because uh, although I have done what all these big bands have done, yeah. and I have taught bands to become world champions, I've done that in that uh -huh. time, uh, I don't presume that I know more than Richard Parks or any of these guys, uh, I assume that I will know some things that they don't know, and obviously they'll have some tricks up their sleeves that I grade don't know. Grade ones tends to be a wee bit vexatious, doesn't oh, it? Aye, aye, Whereas aye. the lower grades, they, they are more open to the idea, well, that somebody else can win today. Aye. And also, <laughs> also, also, if you, what are you going to tell, like, if you listen to any of the top six bands at the World Championship last top year. Top eight. What are you going to tell them that will make a difference to the performance? These guys, these guys rise or fall on anything that goes wrong. Correct. They tend to rise and fall a wee bit on sound, but it's not necessarily the case. Mm -hmm. They will rise or fall depending on the programme that they present. Of course. But you're not going to tell them anything that they don't know. But when I'm writing a criticism for... Uh, one of the lower grade bands. I'm. I hope I'm giving them advice uh, yeah. that will improve sort of positive it. That will improve critique. their performance. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. As you say, it's difficult to do that with the top six or eight and a uh, grade one. Uh, you touched on uh, tunes. This is a wee hobby horse of mine. Uh, some of the very very poor compositions. Again, my perception. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, that are presented a, in, in recent years. I hope it's maybe changing now, I don't know. Um, yet, 
again, it's my perception, and please correct me here, that judges, uh, as a general rule, aren't allowed to comment on the quality of the actual composition of tunes that they are presenting. That's right. That's Is that right? right? Yeah. What's, That's a, what, what's the story about that? Well, once again, it comes down to a matter of taste. For example, uh, you know, there's the, the different types of real playing, and one great example is... But you can also play that as... I can't do the second way very well because I, I, I was never taught to do that. Aye, it's round or pointed. Yeah, 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 there's no cuts or dots in it. Right. So your band comes on and plays that tune. Aye. Uh, and I tell you I don't like that arrangement. Okay. That's when you will say, but how well played was it? Was it in tune? And that kind of thing. And what the element that's being missed... I think, and I'm not, I'm not entirely happy with the fact that I can't comment on the quality of the material. I might say it's too difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I might talk about the presentation of it, but I can't actually tell them it's not a good tune. But I would like to be able to say to them, because once upon a time we were able well, to do that. The guy in the music committee. Yeah. Why don't you push that through? Well, the organisation's fairly democratic. And so you've got the wee guy for Fife for Inverness yeah, yeah. who's representing his association with the vote yeah. and says, sounds a, a fantastic idea but I'm not voting for it. Right. That's the way it can work. That's basically the, the story there. Yeah, it's, the, the association is a demo democratic organisation. I think that uh, the difference in modern instruments is that the sound quality is better. Uh, the only the other day I was looking at a bagpipe that was uh, about a hundred years old, and it had two pipe chanters in it. And when you looked at the pipe chanters, when I tried reeds in them, they were very flat at the bottom and through the roof in the top hand. And when you looked at the modern instruments, they were compressed at both ends, as it were. Okay. So you got a better balanced sound. Uh, but when you think about, and it goes back to, I'm not convinced that. Uh, people were as precise at making instruments then as they are now. I'm not convinced that every little uh, tool that went down the throat of that chanter, the critical part to keep it clean, was applied with the same pressure or the tool was the same size as it always had been. The tools get blunt as well. Of course they do, and they wear down. Mm. Uh, so all of these things happen. I was lucky when I, worked, when I went into Granger and Campbell's. My pal worked behind the, in the factory and... He showed me a lot of these things mm -hmm. about how it went on. Yeah. Do you know they had a kettle with drone reeds stuck in it? And when the kettle boiled, the drone reeds sounded because <laughs> the steam came through it. Just absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And uh, I learned so much about it there. But what I did learn was that um, pipers have to accept, the same as drummers have to accept, the precision construction of their instrument. Only if the instrument's well made are you able to do something with it. How many times have you com come across a bagpipe that somebody else has played and it's an absolute nightmare to make it work? Yeah. I had an experience in, in uh, I, worked, I was visiting a pipe band in the continent and quite by accident I gave them a big lecture about materials, how they're used, how they, they vibrate and all that kind of thing. And they had actually a, a batch of chanters, all came from the same place, all with the same name on it and every single one of them vibrated differently. You could take a reed from one, which was nice and easy to blow, put it in another, and it was hard to blow. You've done that with even pipe chanters in your own box. Yep. So the, the precision of making instruments is much better now. Everybody does a much better job now. Yeah. You can be pretty sure that the thing that you're getting... And I think the level of service is tremendous, absolutely tremendous, that... Uh, you're now getting uh, help from the manufacturers about how to do things. Yes. Even even if you buy a set of plastic drone reeds, you get a, a book Aye. that tells you how to and not how what, to set them up. I, what, what I loved what I loved was uh, the old lorry shop when you went in to buy drone reeds. The three drone reeds were in a cellophane packet. And that was what you got. Aye. There was none of this big box of reeds like Granger's had that you could wade try through. Them. You, you could wade through them aye, and pick them. No, aye. it was three aye. drone reeds in a packet you got, and that was your, your aye, tank. Your white. Give, give, give me a six bob. That's right. That's right. Bob, you know. <laughs>
James, his Sunday name, Jim, thanks very much. Uh, we've uh, done a long interview. Thanks very much for your time. I found it personally very fascinating. I trust that the listener in the next thousand years watching this on the internet or whatever we've got in the 2500 uh, also finds it fascinating. If they don't, they've not got much a sense of humour. I, I think also I can just say that uh, if in a thousand years we get any emails from them, it would be quite nice to be able to reply to them. Right. <laughs> Thanks very much, folks, for listening. Thank you. Pleasure. Great fun. <laughs>